Okay. Good afternoon and thanks for joining this session. I'm only going to be on stage for a second and those of you that know me will understand how wonderful that is. That I'm only going to be here for a minute. Uh, I'm delighted today to introduce a couple of customers uh, who are going to talk about how they're putting AWS to work to modernize uh, their organizations and deliver enhancements in product experience for internal and external users. We wanted to get these two speakers into the keynote this morning, uh, but there's a couple of things you need to know about them. First of all, they've both graced this keynote stage before. In fact, one of them has graced the stage at AWS reInvent alongside Verna last year. So they, they're already very experienced in that shorter format that we use in the keynote. So we thought we'd we challenge them by giving them a little bit more time, a little bit more uh, stuff to talk about. But also, I really wanted to give an opportunity for them to get into more detail about what they're doing within their organizations, how they're using the cloud, and what kind of benefits this is delivering to them. So it's a longer format. Uh, first of all, we're going to be joined by Richard Atkinson. He's a technology director and CIO at Nando's, uh, my favorite chicken restaurant, I must admit. I basically live on the stuff when I'm in London, so don't tell my wife that. Uh, and then Chris Turville, who is Head of Cloud and Platform Agility at Trainline. Actually, it's another product that I use weekly to get myself down here from, uh, from my home in Yorkshire. Big fan of the product, big fan of what Chris and Richard have done respectively with, with their organizations with technology modernization. So without further ado, I'm going to queue a video, I'm going to leave the stage, and then we're going to be joined by Richard Atkinson, Technology Director from Nando's. Thank you. Wow, that's a big video to follow. It's, uh, it's like when boxers come onto the stage and they've got their music, but um, uh, it's a lot to follow. Uh, but Nando's at a tech conference, I think that's probably a first for Nando's, uh, if not a first for a tech conference. Um, so I'm here to talk about why Nando's is going cloud first. And, and if you like, just to cut to the chase and at risk of people heading straight for the doors after I've said what I'm about to say, uh, the reason we work with AWS and we have a cloud first strategy is you know, we let them focus on the nuts and bolts so that we can focus on what the whole machine is doing. You know, we're, I think none of our customers would particularly expect us to be experts at managing server or infrastructure hardware. Um, you know, they want to focus and have conversations about bigger concerns than that. So our strategy within that is really about becoming digital. A few steps beforehand, but becoming digital. And, and that's our wording for trying to explain how Generation Zs, you know, those, those folks that have been brought up with the internet, um, they, they don't really know a world without smartphones. What do the Gen Zs want from a brand like Nando's? Whether that's interacting with us as a customer, or whether that's interacting with us as an employee-employer relationship. So today I want to focus in two particular areas. One on that employee side, uh, but in our world we, we use the term Nandoka. It's kind of a cutesy Afro-Portuguese heritage kind of lingo. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about how AWS is helping us re-architect our business. So starting with those employees. Going back to that video, um, 
<laughs> it's, it's funny seeing it on a big screen, because normally I just watch it on my laptop, but um, there's a reason I showed it, and it, it's just put your heads in a place of thinking of Nando's as being such, something much more than just piri piri chicken, chips, Coca-Cola. Um, you know, the video obviously uh, is um, not exactly a normal day at the office, but it covers the music that surrounds our heritage, the fashions, the artwork, the energy, the passion, you know, so much more than just the taste. And there's something very planned about that, very authentic about that, that actually we're, we're a business family owned and it allows us to have a, a very deep purpose. And that purpose we describe as changing lives together. And this is sort of the framework we use upon screen to, describe, to, to think of the communities that we can have an impact on in ter terms of changing lives together. It's also about ourselves. So if we start in our local community, you know, the, the biggest impact Nando's can perhaps have on the world in changing lives is that we're often the first place of employment for someone. Maybe it's their first job outside of school or it's filling a gap year or uh, it's kind of a holiday job. But what we do is we try and leave the individual, the Nandoka, with the foundational skills that they can carry into the rest of their career. You know, have a productive economic life. But we also support restaurants in, in supporting the local community in other ways. So at the right-hand side, you've, you've got some fundraising. This is our Stockton Heath restaurant, fundraising for the Warrington Youth Club. In the middle, there's a lot of restaurants that are actually, um, believe it or not, interested in beekeeping. Uh, and there you have the, the, the pouring of the honey from our honey harvest. But probably most significantly, but this is just a selection of three, but no chucking our chicken is, is just huge for us. You know, we, we donate one million meals per annum to charities local to our restaurants that we build relationships with. And, and it's really a no-brainer. You know, this is chicken that would otherwise just be going to waste. So, you know, why not do something sensible with it? Southern Africa. But I'm just going to pause for a moment. Before I start talking about Southern Africa, I've already caveated this is probably the first time Nando's has spoken at a tech conference, and you might be thinking, this is a bit tech light so far. It's deliberate. Because we work with AWS and we're cloud first, it means that I, I'm a technologist at Nando's, I'm an engineer by background for, for my whole career, but I'm allowed to exist in a space that's trying to solve higher order problems. You know, I'm, I'm sitting with a business talking about what's, what they mean by strategy, not what we used to mean by strategy back in the day as a technologist. So that's why I'm talking about some of these things that are really important to us at Nando's, and I'll, I'll bring it together around technology shortly. Southern Africa. Uh, you, you might know that the Nando's taste is, is, is known as piri piri. Uh, that taste comes from the African bird's eye chili, and only the African bird's eye chili, and it grows in four countries in Southern Africa. So across Malawi, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and South Africa itself, we have 1,400 farmers that we have direct relationships with to source those chilies. So, of course, we depend on them, but they depend on us in turn for their livelihood. So they're a very, very important community for us. And if you look at inside one of our restaurants, for so every 10 people working in one of our restaurants, there are two farmers being supported by Nando's and, and their whole family. And so we, at the beginning of a growing season, we'll commit to the price we'll pay at the end of the season, and that allows them a, a level of financial planning so they can consider health, education, a roof over their heads. Uh, we have uh, an agri-academy, which is where this photo is taken from, where we, we train people in how to farm chilies, how to improve their yield in chilies, but also in experimenting with new farming systems. So in this particular photo, you have the chilies being grown up on planks, so the farm uh, can grow uh, sort of subsistence crops like um, salad crops for the consumption by the family. So they're, they're supporting themselves as well as helping us. And a very big issue across those four countries is malaria. So the left-hand side of these slides, you can see some of the work we have trying to help with the problem of malaria. So malaria kills one child every 60 seconds in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, for the farmers in uh, the four countries I'm describing, it costs them about 25% of their household income to deal with the consequences of malaria. Now, just imagine, you know, 25% of your income going into just trying to solve one issue in the area of healthcare with your family. So, so we work on preventative measures such as using non-toxic chemicals to spray people's homes to kill the mosquitoes that carry the malaria. There's an important creative community to us 
And if you've ever been in one of our restaurants, we, we sort of treat it a bit like um, a very accessible art gallery. In fact, you, you may know Nando's has the world's largest uh, collection of African contemporary art. But given the audience, I picked out an artist called Maurice, um, and he salvages components from computers. So that suit he's wearing and the bag and the shoes are all made from old keyboard parts and, and uh, peripherals. Um, so that helps us with some of our end-of-life kits, for sure. And then you have the planet. And it, it sounds a bit grandiose, but actually this is something coming from our Nandokas up through the organization. Um, I dare say I'm a bit long in the tooth of those people that typically work at, at Nando's. And those that are in our restaurants are just so passionate about the future of this planet. They, they need us to take responsibility for our impact. They want us to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. So this photo is of our newest restaurant in Cambridge which uses 100% renewable energy, and not just the electricity. That bit's relatively easy. Not straightforward, but relatively easy. Um, but also the gas. All of the gas we're using in this restaurant to, to especially grill the chicken is from renewable sources. It's uh, anaerobic digestion. We have rainwater harvesting. Uh, it, it has um, even lampshades made of mushrooms. I'm not quite sure why that helps with sustainability, but uh, it's, it's a very important subject to us. And the reason I'm going through all of these things is that here's our Nandokas. How do we empower them to get involved in all of these great things? This isn't just about content. This is about inspirational stories. And if we want to maximize our impact in changing lives together, we need those Nandokas to not just re-content, but have, have an emotional connection to, to become passionate about the brand and passionate about our purpose. And as with many of the world's problems, we decided to solve it with an app. Uh, those Nandokas, you know, they don't want to read long emails. They don't need to stand in the corridor at the back of the restaurant reading posters that have been put on the walls. You know, they want something in their pocket. They can read it on their commute. They can read it in between the shifts. So we created an app where you've got everything from the basic day-to-day -to -day tools to do the job, through to tools that help individuals personally develop to be the best they can be by the time they leave Nando's. And we celebrate people when they leave Nando's with those enhanced skills. It gives them insights that helps them operate their restaurant and empower them to feel that it's their restaurant. But I think most importantly and relevant to this conversation is about this whole project being a catalyst for how Nando's delivers technologies. You know, we're moving away from waterfall. Here's, here's some photos from in and amongst the project. You know, it uses the, all the latest contemporary development practices that you can imagine. Therefore, there's a lot of post-it notes around. And it allowed us to go you know, on that kind of typical non-waterfall journey, the way you have a low-fidelity version of your product, gradually working through the beta in the hands of users as a high-fidelity product. But because we're using AWS, we're able to go on that journey in only six weeks. In six weeks from inception, we had products in the hands of Nandokas. A few words on what we built in that. We, we have a content sharing, a story sharing facility. There's the ability for Nandoka to see their rotor, see when they're meant to be in the restaurants, request changes. There's the ability to see job opportunities. And of course, we've got GIFs. Or if you've been hiding in a cave for 15 years, GIFs. And all along that journey, the methodology we followed, was, was, it just wasn't determined by the technology. It was determined by us wanting to make, test, learn. That was the methodology. That was the nature of our iteration. And I remember you know, when, when actually the, the lead times on hardware actually got built into your waterfall, and that, that started to shape the nature of the project. So this has broken us completely beyond that. And we've been working with our partners from Made by Many, our chosen agency, on this particular project, and they're, they're helping to educate us in how to do these whole projects. So what are the results like? Well, they're great. I mean, we got some numbers there um, and, and a bit of a narrative, but I think just reflecting back on what I was saying about as, as a technologist, getting involved in higher-level conversations, working at problem-solving at a higher level of abstraction, you know, to, to, be, to be getting the emotional reaction from users and not just kind of a user acceptance test that's sort of perfunctory and, yeah, it works, and this, that, and the other works. You know, you've got this seriously emotional connection, and e even the word love being used. So, re-architecting our business. Uh, let's just rewind a little bit to about a year ago. 
Um, this is the end of chapter one of our story of going to the cloud. Uh, at the beginning of chapter one, we had our own server room, you know, our, our, our data center, our private cloud. Um, but it was actually, it was in the back of a restaurant uh, in West London. I mean, it's, it's a pretty incongruous place to, to stick a data center, but it made sense at the time. Uh, and this is the day in these photos where the, the final decommissioning was taking place. You can see the diesel generator being taken away. You can see the, the cooling equipment being, being dismantled. And, and this was really the beginning of the end of our private cloud world and the beginning of our journey to the cloud. And what, what's the context for that? The context is, what are we? Are, are we a restaurant operator? We were pretty clear that we were a few years ago, but something's changed. What, what's changed? Well, one of the things that's changed is that when we were a restaurant operator, our world revolved around these restaurant-centric EPOS systems, electronic points of sale. But then the Gen Zs, they wanted something different, or even the millennials. They wanted takeaway. So you add into the mix that, okay, so the Nando's food is being taken to home or work, so we need, a, we need some front end, we need some web, we need some app. So you, we went out looking for the EPOS integration partners, but you could start to feel a tension. You could start to feel that there's some channels evolving, there's some experiences evolving that aren't constrained by the four walls of a restaurant. And that the EPOS integration partners are really just trying to paper over the cracks at the, at the core of the problem. And then customers wanted delivery. So those that were in the keynote this morning, we, we're working with Deliveroo. Um, these aren't actually Deliveroo riders. There are a couple of colleagues that were trying it for a day to see what it's like and see how we can improve a Deliveroo rider's daily life. But when you put that into the mix, it, it was kind of our tipping point. I, we've got to re-architect this. The, you know, our business is changing. So we got to re-architect the technology underneath it. So we replaced that sort of how do you integrate things with the restaurant-centric system with, with middleware. I, I could have added some nuance to this diagram, but just keeping it simple, middleware. So we're using a middleware from a vendor called uh, Flypay. They, in turn, are hosted in the cloud. So this morning when Verna was running through other big tech names that are actually hosted in AWS as well, you know, it's fascinating how the whole supply chain that we're in is, is going to the cloud. So we're now in the middle of the journey of aligning the rest of our systems to this more horizontal platform-based model rather than the kind of vertical stacks that are dedicated to a channel. So we've implemented a, a payment platform from Ingenico. So whether the customer is paying by card in a restaurant with a chip and pin device or whether they're online, it all uses those same Ingenico rails. I'm just going to expand a bit in two areas, identity provision and food delivery. Um, I think a lot of you probably work in enterprises where when you arrive on day one, you get issued with your email address, maybe a mobile phone. Um, that's the case for maybe three to five percent of Nandockers that work in more sort of central head office type functions, office based functions. But actually most of our Nandockers, they're, they're turning up with their own identity. You know, they don't want to be issued with one. So when they introduce themselves, we want to accept them as who they are. We, we don't want them to have to force themselves to be just like the payroll number. I've also not yet met an Andocker who isn't also a customer. So actually, when you're thinking about identity, we want to recognize one individual as a human being, whether they're a customer, an Andocker, or both. And to that end, we've built, in AWS, an environment where you have Active Directory for those people who are issued with a Nando's email address. We extend that with an identity provision service, provider service, that covers the Nandokas that aren't in Active Directory and the millions of customers that use our online services. We wrap that up in Auth0, which is Software as a Service Authentication Service, also hosted in AWS. And we apply some visual treatments to the front and call it Nando's ID. And that's been baked into our stacks gradually. And so the food delivery element of our world already has it. And, and, and that food delivery world is built, as you might expect, on Lambda. It's consumer facing. It has the peaks and troughs of consumer demand. And for us to have no service to manage as a chicken and chips business that does a little bit more, uh, that's great. Um, it's continuously scaling, both up and down. And you're being billed at, at sub-second. You know, it's highly, highly cost effective. And, and how's this? All these channels, how's it going to play out? How's the value chain going to change? 
You, know, you already have a situation where there's a third party deliveroo who you can order Nando's food with in some areas and they'll deliver. In some areas, you can order food to be delivered through Nando's front end assets. But we know that Uber Eats also now offer food delivery. Amazon restaurants offer food delivery. So I just went online and I found a picture of this typical Nando's customer, I think we'll call him Ed. Don't know where he got that card from. What, what's going to change about his experience with us? Well, about this time last year, Amazon launched the Echo in the UK. So you have a kind of device channel as well. And who knows, in the future, we're likely to have probably Amazon drone delivery as well. So, Nando's. Amazon Web Services is helping us engage with our Nandockers on a more meaningful basis so that they have greater impact in changing lives together. And they're helping us reorganize our business from being a restaurant operator to dealing with these very fluid channels that are always evol evolving. I'm going to hand you over to uh, Chris from the train line. And uh, if you liked what I had to say, then you can thank him because it was train line that got me here this morning. And if not, just you know, offer up a few boos or something as he comes up onto stage. Chris. Thank you very much. Cheers. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm here to talk about Trainline's cloud and DevOps migration journey over the last couple of years. Um, specifically, I'd like to share a little bit about how we went about our migration and uh, talk a little bit about the impact it had on our culture, on our processes, and on our technology stack. So, hopefully, as most of the people seem to know who Train9 are, you may not realize how big we are. So we operate across 24 countries. We do 2.3 billion pounds worth of ticket sales a year. We help 125,000 customers every single day make smarter journeys on the rail. That's what we are passionate about. The reason I'm putting this slide up is because we are not a born-in-the-cloud startup. We've been around almost 20 years. Um, so we had, as a, at the start of this migration journey, our fair share of technical debt and challenges that I'm sure you have as well. So let me take you back to June 2015. We had a number of problems. First, we had a monolithic application. So it was a big blob of .NET with a massive Oracle Exadata in the back end. We had one release every six weeks, one proper rocket launch release. Everyone coming in at midnight, taking a site down for five hours, crushing your fingers, bringing it back up, and hoping everything is OK. We had a lot of legacy technology, old operating systems. We had MSMQ, BizTalk, we even found some VB6. Uh, we had physical data centers, which were slow to change and uh, with an, uh, not an ideal disaster recovery situation. We had centralized ops teams. In fact, we had centralized everything teams. It was all very functional. The classic case of developers writing it over here, throwing it over a high wall, and then expecting some other team to run it somehow. And last but not least, we had environment snowflakes by which I mean every environment was unique and special, and nothing ever worked. So we actually reckoned that about 30 to 40% of our developer time was wasted purely on infrastructure issues. It works over here, it doesn't work over there. Why? What is even running in those different environments? Um, how long do I have to wait for this ticket to be fixed by somebody else? It was a very um, slow process. Now, if I just fast forward to the end of our migration, where we are today, Clear blue skies. We are 100% in AWS. So all of our development, test, and production estate is running in AWS. Uh, we're across three availability zones and two different regions. We broke our monolith down to about 300 microservices, which can be managed and deployed independently. We are now doing 180 releases a week, which is massively different to doing one every six weeks. Despite the number of releases going up, our reliability has also gone up. So we've got 60% less downtime since moving to continuous integration and delivery. And the cherry on the cake is we've actually managed to save 1.2 million in CapEx, despite, you know, as, as well as all of these things. Now, the bulk of this migration was done in about 14 months from a standing start of, right, we've got an Amazon account, now what, to having everything running in production. So it was a very, very fast uh, migration. So what I want to talk to you about is what our migration approach was, and then just give you a couple of points each on, on culture, process, and technology. So the migration approach at a very high level looked a little bit like this. So we started off with architecture and standards. 
what's the MVP you need to get started with AWS resources? If you get start spinning up infrastructure without having some basic naming standards and architecture in mind, you, the genie's out of the bottle and you'll have to try and bring everything back. So we wanted to start from a, a solid baseline. We then in, um, automated our common infrastructure. So all the core networks, the VPCs, the load balancers, all those good things, we scripted those out with CloudFormation. We then migrated our application services. So this was one application at a time, all the way through from development testing into production. Done on the basis of risk, on latency sensitivity, and on dependencies. Um, we eventually got to a critical mass where we were able to tackle the big bad Oracle Exadata, um, which we did as a big bang release, taking that along with the five to 10 services which are very closely coupled with it, moving that over as a big bang, and then finishing off all the other services that um, we're waiting for that to happen. Now, that's a very high level view. I think it's useful, hopefully, to dig into the next level of detail of how that actually worked. So there are three, from a technical point of view, there are three main streams. There's the infrastructure stream, application stream, and data stream, and then a whole bunch of other stuff as well. From an infrastructure point of view, the first thing we did was an environment strategy. What environments do we want? Who owns them? Who patches them? How do changes get promoted between the different environments? We then put in place the Amazon and the security architecture, because those are very hard to retrofit once you've got started, and some basic Amazon start standards around IAM, S3, security groups, and so on. We then coded out the core network and the common infrastructure services that the applications needed to run. And then we got to building the deployment automation for applications that the developers would use. And the last step then was making that self-service so the developers could use these um, infrastructure th things themselves without needing Jira tickets and ping pong of that. From an application point of view, we started with a cloud readiness checklist. So this was a very simple sort of half page Excel spreadsheet which said, these are the things that, look, that good looks like that you need to do in your application before it can go into the cloud. So for example, getting rid of static IPs, making sure you're using centralized logging, um, using encryption at rest and in transit, these kind of changes. But it's a very simple, high-level thing. And what we did is we gave that guidance to the different teams, and they cross-referenced it with the applications they have. So they then have a, a spreadsheet saying all the things that need to be done and all of their applications. And you can see a heat map of what needs to be done, and it helps with the prioritization of the work. The, um, the bulk of the effort, obviously, is app remediation, going through that checklist, making sure the applications actually work and then migration um, once you've got the basic infrastructure stuff in place and have something there to support the applications. And the data path follows a similar kind of thing. We have a readiness checklist, catalog, assess, analyze, optimize, and migrate. So all of that is um, actually not the hard part. The hard part is what's the other things around it. Culture, communication, changing the organization structure, changing people's roles and responsibilities, making sure you do training at the right time, uh, managing the project, and all those things. So let me talk a little bit about culture then. So in order to um, begin a DevOps cultural change, we need to be clear on what DevOps is. There's lots of different definitions about. This is, for what it's worth, my version. Um, so to me, DevOps is first and foremost a culture, a culture focused on empowering teams and on continuous improvement. And that culture is supported by a set of proven practices, things like infrastructure as code, continuous delivery, um, having developers on call, uh, making production metrics visible to everybody, all and so on and so forth. And those practices, in turn, are supported by a set of new skills, cloud technologies, pipelines, chef, puppet, and so on. But importantly, DevOps covers everybody involved from having an idea to having it in front of the customer. So it's not just developers and operations, it's everybody involved in that process. So that's, that's my view of it. Now, one of the things that helps us uh, sort of establish a DevOps mindset is moving from a project mentality to a product mentality. So what I mean by that um, is this. So projects, by their nature, by definition, they have an end date. They're temporary. Products, on the other hand, are ongoing. And what that means is you have a more long-term view if you're working in terms of a product. You're not so worried about doing things to hit the deadline and move on to something else. You have to live with the consequences of your actions. Projects tend to be measured, primarily at least, on time and cost rather than business value. So yes, of course, projects are measured on scope and business value. But when the deadline approaches, we all know what happens. You shift the scope. You put it to phase two. You redefine success, or you just build up tech debt to make sure you can hit the deadline. 
On the other hand, if you're looking at the product view in a longer term mindset, it's about the business value only. Projects tend to be cross-cutting across different teams and across different apps, whereas products, the idea is that each of those can move more or less independently from each other. Projects tend to be driven top-down as opposed to being driven and owned by the teams that develop them. And that ownership is very important from the point of view of empowering those teams. Um, and last but not least, change control. Projects in, change in a project is a disruptive thing, whereas within a product, it's just normal evolution of that product. Anyone who's ever tried to raise a business case to justify fixing tech debt will know how difficult change control can be in projects. So this, these two things combined. So how do you apply those to your organization structure? So what we did is we broke down our central functional teams and we made them into what we call clusters. I don't know why we call them clusters. Nobody else I'm aware of calls them clusters, but you probably know them as squads or tribes or those kind of things. Same concept. They're product focused, they're cross-functional, they're empowered teams, they're small, and they're durable. And again, that means the people in them stay for long enough that they have to live with the consequences and also get to know the product properly. Um, so what we then have is a set of these clusters, each of which working on different products, but there's a risk, obviously, that they'll just go off and start diverging. So we also have communities. You may know them as guilds and other terminology, um, but basically they're there to help share knowledge and best practices across the different clusters to make sure that you know, we're doing things in a consistent way. Now, we actually still have remnants of the functional teams, and there's a very good reason for that, because they, they behave differently to before. So let's take security as an example. All of our developers have, are trained on secure development, so they understand why it's important and how to code securely. We then have a security community with more people who, you know, who are more specialist in that knowledge, in that area. They help the developers um, when there are problems and so on. And then we have a small centralized security team where our security architects and our penetration testers and so on live, and they set the guidelines, they run the communities, and then they float across the teams dealing with anything that needs to be escalated rather than having to be involved in every single decision, which is obviously not practical if you're doing 180 releases a week. And a similar pattern applies to architecture, quality engineering, and platform services, which in our world is a team which wraps Amazon in train line standards and exposes that as a service to the different clusters to consume. So let's talk a little bit about processes and governance then. So most organizations have what I call big governance. If anyone's ever worked in financial services, you will know what I mean by this. Um, so big changes require big governance. Most, um, when you're doing periodic big releases, big releases are difficult because there's a lot of change, which means a lot of people have to be involved. It's hard to communicate what's in that release. It's hard to understand it. It's harder to test. It's harder to roll out. It's harder to roll back. Everything gets harder when the change is big. And a lot of this governance sort of apparatus only exists because the change is big in the first place. If the change is small, then it's very easy to understand. It's very easy to test. It's very easy to communicate. Not many people need to be involved, and so forth. So the key to DevOps governance is to have very small changes. And I mean single stories, single bug fixes, going all the way through to production. Um, so we moved everything to continuous delivery. Our number of releases went up exponentially, but our downtime reduced, which is somewhat counterintuitive. But it's not the release that is risky. It's the fact that it's a big change going out that's risky. If each change is small, well-tested, automatically managed, got monitoring in place, and so on, the risk of each individual release is almost negligible. And that's why the downtime reduced. Another principle we use for um, governance is this one, responsibility with visibility. So anyone in our clusters can release any of their components to production at any time. But if they do that, everybody in the organization can see that they've done that and um, can see what the result was. So it just encourages a healthy caution. Um, but they have that ability to do it. And because they can make releases anytime they like, it happens during the day when everyone's there, which again helps release, reduce the risk. Um, last point on processes is around performance. So we know if our website responds just 0.3 of a second slower, it costs us 8 million pound a year. So performance is really important to us. And yet, we do not do performance testing as standard as part of our release process. Because most of the time, most of the changes people make do not break performance. So it's just a waste of effort. What we do instead is we let people um, put changes live, and then we can monitor in real time and see if there's any performance degradation. And if so, within five to 10 seconds, we can flip it back to the previous version. 
they still have the choice of doing performance testing if they think it's going to be a change which needs it, but most of the time it's not a requirement. So it's a sort of retrospective governance model which can be applied to a number of things which are traditionally done up front but might not necessarily need to be done that way. Okay, let me talk a little bit about technology and automation then. So this is a huge topic. What I want to focus on is, is the deployment technology because I think that's where a lot of people struggle. Um, this is my favorite slide. This is the deployment continuum. So all the different types of, um, of uh, deployment mechanisms that you can have, from ugly, ugly pets through to the holy unicorn of serverless architecture. Now, the point of this is that most organizations in the real world are not born in the cloud startups, and they have legacy estate. They're going to have a mixture of all these different types of things. So how do you migrate your applications into the cloud as quickly as possible? Well, you've basically got three choices. You can either try and modify your entire application estate to fit a particular tool, so let's say Kubernetes, but then you have to containerize all your applications, many of which may not be suitable for that, and it reduces, uh, sorry, it extends how long it takes before you can get the benefits of cloud in the first place. So that's not necessarily ideal. The other choice, of course, you can have a different set of tooling and a different set of processes for each of the different types, but then you've got much more overhead and probably much more cost of having five different tools. Um, the last option, and the one which we, after much consideration, went for, is to build something yourself. But obviously, that's quite a, an undertaking and quite an effort. Now, what we did is we built something which we have very imaginatively named Environment Manager, um, which uh, is probably the secret source which allowed us to get in as fast as possible. And uh, what it is is a platform for continuous delivery and DevOps on AWS. So essentially, it is a website, so it's a self-service portal where our developers can just go and manage their infrastructure, do deployments, toggle things, set the load balancer rules, all those kind of things. There's an API and a command line tool, which allows it to integrate very nicely into all the automation pipelines, whatever tools they're using for that. Um, and there's also an SNS eventing system off the back, so if you want to respond to an infrastructure event like someone's deployed to production, you can respond as, with automation. And there's a governance element as well. So there are reports for the security team to say, um, which servers you know, need patching, um, how old are the servers, um, what deployments have been going on. Um, and the governance also is in terms of automating our standards. So we don't want people to have to read wiki pages to know what the standards are. It should just happen. So when you call the deployment API, all the correct naming, tagging, security groups, and so on are applied to the, the infrastructure that's created for you. Um, and lastly, governance in terms of cost. So this tool does all the environment scheduling for us to turn our test environments on and off or particular servers on and off for batch jobs and so on. Um, and the nice thing is that this is also open source. So if that sounds something interesting to you, please do check it out and let us know what you think. Um, now, I realize that this all sounds a little bit abstract, so I'll just show you a couple of screenshots to try and make it a bit more real. Um, so this is the main page which shows the environments, so this is a subset of our environments. You can see who owns them, what they're used for, whether they're currently on or off, and those kind of things. You can then drill into an environment, and you can see all the auto-scaling groups and what services and versions have been deployed to those environments. You can see whether the AMIs are up to date, um, what the schedule is for each of those individual ASGs. And then we can click in even further to the ASG, and we can see all the instance details. We can modify launch configurations, we can see the the deployment log of each service on each server. Uh, we can link through on remote desktop to jump to the server and various other things. Um, so there's an awful lot more to it than that, but it hopefully gives you an, an idea of, of what it does. But this is sort of the, what it allowed us to do. Because it's unopinionated, it doesn't care about whether it's Windows or Linux, whether it's Java or .NET, whether it's single or multi-tenancy, it allowed us to take all our legacy crap as well as the new stuff, migrate it in, and then remediate it in place which is how we were able to get in so fast. So a few summary points then. The main thing to remember with a DevOps migration is that it's fundamentally it's a cultural change. So it's all about the people. The technology, to a certain extent, is a solved problem. I'm not saying it's trivial, but it is largely a solved problem. The hard part is bringing your people along for the journey. Um, I would say that cloud is a prerequisite now for business agility. We certainly wouldn't be able to do what we can do without um, being built on AWS for that um, flexibility it gives you. It's very important to think about projects, not projects. Um, that mindset encourages long-term thinking. It encourages a focus on business value rather than deadlines. Um, 
and it's important also to have very small changes. Simple, small changes dis deconstruct and simplify all of the governance nonsense that you, that you previously thought you needed. Um, and related to that, you can build in your governance rules to your automation. And last but not least, using automation to help make the right way easy. Nothing speeds up a cultural change like the way you want, being simple, quick, easy, pretty, and, and happy, uh, making people happy to use it. Um, so for those of you who don't have our app, um, what's wrong with you? Please, immediately go and download it um, and get yourself on a train. Uh, we've got a Twitter account. There's also an engineering blog, um, which you can look at for details of what we're up to at the moment. Um, and what I'll just do is I'll finish, if you don't mind, with a completely shameless plug um, for my next venture, which is actually Train9 spinning off uh, Environment Manager and offering it as a SaaS solution with some DevOps advisory and um, a sort of pre-built pack of stuff to help you get going with cloud and DevOps. So if that's of interest to you, um, please let me know. Thank you very much. <laughs>